Hello everyone, welcome back to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Israel. This is Parashat Yitro, Exodus 18, 19, and 20. And this one's called the Ten Commandments, appropriately so. If you're still with us, that's, that's fantastic. Hang on. We're almost there. So, it's very interesting, right? It took me a while to write this because it was happening as I was writing this, as it usually does. But anyway, it was a very interesting week. Um, so I think we all got it wrong, all right? Or at least it's just me. I'm speaking for myself. Um, I think the general consensus, I think we're all looking at this from an incorrect angle. Don't ask where I'm going just yet. Just You'll get a headache. Just go with me, okay? Just sit back, relax, and just enjoy the show, I guess. So follow my train of thought over here and see what resonates with you. There have been different time periods in our history, starting with Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob. The patriarchs, also known as the Milkava, the chariot of God in this world. God chose them to manifest himself in this world as what? As El Shaddai, we learned. But only to the patriarchs, in other words, not for the rest of the world, the patriarchs, and then afterwards the children of Israel. But up until that point, he was known to the world as Elohim, right? The creator and destroyer of the world through the flood. And again, um, confusing the, uh, the tongues of the people and destroying a third of them uh, during the time of the Tower of Babel, right? Two thirds, actually. One third were monkeys. It's very funny. Um, <clears throat> kind of like what's going to happen now. And again, raining fire and sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. When we think of Abraham today, I don't believe that we can necessarily compare ourselves to him the way most people think. But not necessarily only because of who he was, but because the revelation of God in the world was different at that time, as it has been from time to time. God chose Abraham because Abraham chose God. Against the whole world, he chose God. We studied this as well. All these things, you know, I'll let you know if there's something new that's coming up. I'm just putting this together. He chose to be killed in a fiery furnace 20 years before God ever spoke to him. The answer to this is something that, if you think about it, is, is very encouraging. You're like, what? Why? Hear me out. Because it may defy our basic understanding, but we want to go higher, right? Why did God not speak to Abraham earlier? Look at all he did. I mean, clearly he, he proved himself. Since he was a boy, he was searching for God, and God is just watching him grow and, and do these things and make mistakes and continue. He set his heart to seek the truth, and there was not a single person like him in the world. He was the first. That's what's so amazing about this. He was the one who God bet on, right, to, to prove to the angels that man is superior to them in every way, especially after the first 2,000 years of creation, almost. Abraham was born in 1948 to creation. In the meantime, they're looking at, what is man? Oh, them, 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 oh, oh, hey, okay, we got it, that guy, no problem. He didn't even follow his parents. He was not like the rest of the world. He completely separate. He went his own way. Every moment that God did not reveal himself to Abraham, here it is, would count for him as a tremendous merit, right? As righteousness, if you will. Because he would still be moving forward with that kind of faith. And when did God speak to him? When he needed to direct him. Okay, you got to where I need you to be. Now I need you to be right here. You see this? God might uh, choose to speak to all that are his when we are either very deserving, like Abraham, or very much not deserving and in trouble and yet still come forth with a revelation like the generation of the Exodus. Or, I don't know. Anyway, and as we know, the only reason that that happened was because God swore to Abraham 
In other words, it was in Abraham's merit. They were definitely not deserving, right? They were on the 49th level of Tumah. They were almost God. Why did God, uh, almost gone? God chose to come at this time. Why? Because of Abraham. There's a certain pathway that had been formed at that time, one which we no longer need to form, but should search the world to cross through. Okay, Abraham did it, Isaac did it, Jacob did it. And this is God's mercy to the world through Israel, for Israel. Then of course you have Isaac, who gave his life willingly and perfectly. So did Abraham essentially, right? Then Isaac with the Akedah. In complete unison with his father, and we studied this, that it was more difficult for Abraham to do this deed rather than Isaac to get it done to him. This was completely the uh, capturing of the righteous judgment of God. This is, and we'll speak of this later, but hear me out, let this resonate with you. This is performing a mitzvah to perfection. And that changed the world forever. For us till this day you see it's not only what they did it's what's behind everything that they did that made it count it's who they were when they did them i can only think of my story and the things that were shown to me i know which side of the spectrum i fall on okay it's not the one that was deserving uh you know i was not worthy of these things but because of abraham I received the word that would drastically alter my course from where I was absolutely heading. Just like the children of Israel who were crying out to God every day for salvation, wondering if he hears or if he's even listening. Does he even care about us? About me? Let me tell you, he hears, he cares, he sees, he's listening and he's watching intently what each and every one of his creation is doing. Creation, everything. And yet he only gave his word to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would save their descendants. B'nai Yisrael, children of Jacob, children of Israel. Not so for the rest of the nations. All of Israel hears from God at one point or another in their lives. Everyone. Each person according to their specific needs at the right time. Question is, are you listening or not? We do not test God on this, of course, because he is the one who tests us. The world has drastically changed. The world is that which is shifting. The world is that which is shifting. I've been talking about this shift publicly now for uh, for over a year, I think. And I came to tell you that I have been looking at this wrong. It's not that I was completely wrong, but there's yet another element to this. We know that God does not change, nor does his Torah, right? But we forget this, right? God and his Torah do not change. They are the same. They don't kind of go with the times. It's the times that move further and further away. We're the ones that change. God and his Torah, the only one true constant in this world. And the only other thing that does not change along with that absolute, undisputed truth are the righteous, the tzaddikim, the true tzaddikim. Everything, I'm just putting things down right now and it'll all be relevant later. Just go with me. The only way for this to happen is to go with God and not with the world. That, that's it. You want to be a tzaddik? Go with God and not with the world. That's what that means. There's God's way and then there's the highway to where <clears throat> and if you can find this way this path this trail that has been carved into the fabric of the universe by abraham isaac and jacob and moses and joseph and david and aaron every all of them and walk that walk then my friends that which truly changes is us and that's the shift The shift that we feel in the world, how can we feel this? How can certain people from different places, different backgrounds, be feeling the same thing? I'm not the only crazy one. While the rest of the world just goes on like it's a Tuesday. Because we feel it from within. It's not only, oh, well, yeah, we can all watch the news. Which, again, that's what 
everybody they want everybody to watch so you are of the same mind everybody watches it so this is happening so that's happening okay but what's what's really happening this is what we feel from within this is what we almost like know and then we confirm it with others They're like yeah yeah okay and this is something that we are desperately trying to explain to the rest but it's it's all but impossible not everyone feels everything just like not everyone knows everything we you know we're put together kind of like uh, pieces of a puzzle one locked in uh, to the other creates a bigger picture a brighter illumination and a better understanding of where we are and how we are to proceed once Moses was ripened like the fruit that he was like the incredible incredible fruit from the tree of life God revealed through him the complete aspect of mercy and judgment through mercy as well as the hierarchy and the governance of the world through the four letter name of Hashem the Yud the K the Vav and the K now Israel were able to receive the truth in a way that would not have been possible if it were not manifested through the patriarchs you see and then of course established through the conduit that was Joseph <clears throat> these pathways they had to be open they had to be dug until this very day they can be open again once through once and for all through the Jewish people exclusively now this is for the sake of the world and yet even with the help and merit of our forefathers Israel were not worthy of receiving the Torah they were not just because your Israel does not mean you're worthy of receiving the Torah. The Torah is on a completely different level. No one was worthy of receiving the Torah except for one man. And that's the one who God chose to give it to and that he should continue it on. And that was Moses. Just one guy in the whole world was worthy. And if they were not worthy, but they received the Torah, they had to be made worthy. In the third month of the children of Israel's departure from Egypt, on this day they arrived in the desert of Sinai. Bayom Hazeh, on this day. This was the day that Israel ascended to the 50th gate, the 50 levels of purity of Tahara. This is where Israel rose all the way to Binah, to understanding, to enable them to receive what was coming. Again, it wasn't that... It wasn't that they got there on their own merit, right? All the ways have been carved and paved for them. And because of that, God elevated them because of the promises made. So, why was Abraham so unique? Because he lived according to the Torah before the Torah was even given. He ate kosher, he kept Shabbat, he even kept the Passover before the event took place. How did he know what to do? Hmm? Because he, and again, God did not speak to him before this. It's because he studied everything in the world and he saw God in all things. He saw that everything has a point of origin and everything has a system of governance. When he and his descendants lived according to the ways of the Lord, they were blessed with abundance. It's almost like everything was there that would only be given to Israel later. And they lived contrary to the rest of the world. And even Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob had not ascended to the levels that the children of Israel were at at this very point. No, nobody went up to Bina, except for Moses and the children of Israel. Not only that, <clears throat> as they were ascending up the spiritual ladder, they were shedding the 49 levels of impurity that held them captive in Egypt. It wasn't only about uh, taking the Jew out of Egypt, as we all know, but God was taking Egypt out of the Jew. Now, as much as I say that Israel were ascending, which they were, but technically they were being lifted, like we discussed, which is also why the last thing that had to happen before they were fully worthy of receiving the Torah was and will be Amalek. Why Amalek? You heard last week's teaching, right? Was it last week? 
time flies and it's also like anyway where are we i don't know in order to cleanse israel of the doubt within their midst only the worthy can receive the torah if everyone does not want it then no one gets it here's israel for you you think it's easy oh sure if not everyone wants it then no one gets it if everyone does not accept it and receives it then it's not given and if even but a few fall then even one then all will pay the price jews what you're gonna do to receive the torah means to receive god and god is taking us all as a collective this is not some it's a package deal this is not something that can happen partially but completely while the nations try to humanize god israel who are actually in covenant with god essentially listen and take note of everything that i'm going to share with you without the in-depth study of torah in its truest form without the prophets and the ketuvim to reinforce the five books of moses without the sages that have been given the secrets passed down from moses and without the neshama of israel there is no way for a person to truly comprehend what the Torah even is, let alone how to apply it. I'm not making this up. Look around. Which is why God allowed all the other nations to have their own religions and beliefs. Everything in the world. God gave, sure, go ahead. Because those that aren't in it, aren't in it. Those who don't get it, simply don't get it. Everyone wants to get it. Everyone wants to be in. I know most people out there would like to believe that, they, that they're that they in, that they, oh yeah, I, mm, come on. <laughs> and so let me say this. Those who believe they are, I'm sure you can agree with me. Those who believe that they are, that they get it, that they know I'm, I'm in, I know this for sure, I'm comfy where I'm at. But do not live according to this right here. And nothing more, yeah, could not be further from being in. In fact, they are so out <laughs> that they had to start their own club just to feel included in something at all. While those who know little to nothing, but recognize that. See, that's the difference. Recognizing where you're at. And they work from where they are and not from where they wish or think that they are going to be. In other words, those that are actually connected are closer to the truth than any one of us. As I mentioned before, the shift, that feeling, more than a physical feeling, but rather it's an understanding. And this understanding is given. It's only given once it can be acquired you see you have to get there and then okay this knowledge this understanding is something that can be acquired but very few have been willing to pay that price proverbs 4 children hearken to the discipline of father and listen to the uh listen to no understanding okay bina mother Havana, Father, Chochma, Bina, we've learned this. For I give you good teaching, forsake not my instruction. Ki lekach tov natati lachem, Torati al tazovu. We sing this when we return the Torah to the Ark on Shabbat. For I have given you a good teaching. Torati al tazovu, do not leave it. You have to understand what God is saying. For I was a son to my father, a tender one. And only one before my mother, Chochmah Bina, again. And he instructed me and said to me, May your heart draw near to my words. Keep my commandments and live. Shmo mitzvotai v'chaye. Acquire wisdom. Here we go. Here's your acquisition. Acquire understanding. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her. Her, her who? Her the Torah. She. And she will preserve you, love her, and she will guard you. How does one acquire wisdom and understanding? Next verse. The beginning of wisdom is to acquire wisdom, 
and with all your possessions acquire understanding. What's wisdom without understanding? Wisdom is a pile of books, okay? It's a library of all the Torah books ever written, ever. Anyone can read it. You can go on the internet, you can get all the rabbinical studies and the rabbinical books you want. Anyone can, and a lot of people do, but do they have understanding of what they read? See what I'm saying? See what, rather, see what King Solomon the Wise is saying. When it says, all, bekol kinyancha kane bina, what does it mean, all your possessions? All your possessions. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your life force and with all your possessions. Everything you got. Search for her and she will exalt you. Teromemecha. She will honor you when you embrace her. She will give your head a wreath of grace. A teret is a crown. She will transmit to you a crown of glory. Abraham saw God in all things, everything. And so everything he did was for God, with God. You see how that works. Abraham wore a crown, as did Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and Moses, and all of Israel. And of course, the list goes on. They wore 70 crowns, to be exact. <clears throat> and all the heavenly hosts were on pause when they were receiving the Torah. Genesis 18. And the Lord said, Shall I conceal from Abraham what I am doing? And Abraham will become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the world will be blessed in him. For I have known him. Listen. For I have known him. I have known him. From the beginning I have known him. From before he was, he was. Behibaram in Abraham. For I have known him because he commands his sons and his household after him that they should keep the way of the Lord. What's the way of the Lord? Torah. To perform righteousness and justice. Uh, justice. 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 Righteousness and justice. Chesed and Din together. In order that the Lord bring upon Abraham that which he spoke concerning him. From the beginning. Furthermore, this acquisition is a lifelong pursuit, and yet it can be acquired within a flash. Within a single moment, you can gain understanding that might have taken another individual years to acquire, but then it'll also be gone, you see. Now, how can this be? Is this fair? Fairness has nothing to do with it, only truth. Because once you attain truth, emit, then nothing else matters but the truth, because that's all there is. That's why it is said that even a shifcha, a handmaid, who crossed through Yam Suf, saw more and greater things than Yechezkel ben Buzi, the prophet who saw the Merkavot, right, and the Chayot, and the wheels and the throne of God and the, the rainbow and the fiery flashes and the sapphires. How could this be that a, a low, the lower, which is the lowest, the handmaid of one of the servants of the slaves saw more and greater things than Yechezkel did? Are we to say that, that they are greater than Yechezkel? What's their name? We don't know because they're still a handmaid. And you see, that's the difference. It goes in one ear, it comes at woe, and you continue your life like nothing happened. Where Yechezkel ben Buzi, Ezekiel the prophet, he remained right there. So who did it change more? They saw more, but it changed him and it changed us as a result. This is what I'm saying. So again, the moment that you realize that the truth, the emet, it's absolute. There's nothing else but that. And at that moment, you realize it. Your life will change in an instant. This truth, this emet, is what is Jacob, emet le'akov. You gave emet le'akov and chesed le'avraham. This is tiferet. This is the Torah. It's part of our makeup. It's in our DNA. It's who we are. And to be honest, from what I gather, it, takes, uh, it either takes extreme highs or extreme lows in order for that hidden spark to ignite because it's dormant in most people. Most people don't know who they are. 
They can, you know, it could be a lifetime of searching. Some people get it when they're 80, 90 years old. Some people get it on their deathbed. Some people get it when they're younger. Some people have near death or near life experiences. You see what I'm saying? It's not necessarily a matter of how much time or effort you put in. It's up to God. We're just going with it, but never stop. They journeyed from Rephidim, and they arrived in the desert of Sinai, of Sinai, and they encamped in the desert, and Israel encamped there opposite the mountain. So here's one extreme to the next. From Amalek in Rephidim, right? We just finished with Amalek. Next, boom, they're in Mount Sinai. Whoa, whoa, that is definitely from the lowest of the low to the highest of the high. Moses ascended to God, Moshe ala el ha'elokim. And the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, So shall you say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel. God is speaking to Moses in two obvious levels over here. We should all know this by now, as well as two different aspects. We should also know this by now. We have Elohim, judgment, and we have Hashem, the Yud Kei Vav Kei, mercy. This is as far as the aspects go. And what about the levels? We have the house of Jacob and we have the sons of Israel. This is as far as the levels go. Now, and they're both relevant to one another. In other words, you don't... Right, you get it. Okay, this is, the, this is not a redundancy, of course. But we know that from our studies that Jacob is of a lower or less developed, if you will, stature than the children of Israel. It's Yaakov and then Israel, right? It comes from a different place. It's not that one is better than the other. This is something that we all kind of have to get rid of. It's like, who is the greatest? You can't have one without the other. Anything. Who's the greatest in Israel? Can all of Israel uh, receive the Torah if the lowest person isn't ready? No, it doesn't matter. That's why the lowest person is just as important as the highest person. Okay? This is how it works. We're all, you know, the, um, we're all linked together in a chain. So it's not that one is better than the other because they're both the same, but rather these are the different aspects of the same body, Jacob and Israel. Jacob, terrestrial, Israel, celestial. We can also learn from uh, Solomon, who had the wisdom of all of creation. This we know. Solomon's wisdom reached Moses' levels of prophecy, but it came from a completely different place. You understand? Moses was given the understanding of this wisdom from prophecy, while Solomon was given from a different place. No, uh, not to uh, mock anything. Chas v'shalom. They were, in, uh, they tore apart the universe with with their knowledge and wisdom. So he said it simply in Proverbs twenty two six: Educate a child according to his way; even when he grows old, he will not turn away from it. From what? From the Torah, this is why we have the house of Jacob and the children of Israel, the different levels and the different aspect of judgment of mercy. You speak to whoever, even though they are collective, you have to speak to them individually into their hearts. No human can do that. This is God speaking through Moses. You have seen what I did to Egypt. Uh, the Torah continues. And how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to me. Egypt, not the Egyptians, Egypt, celestial, Egyptians, terrestrial. We discussed this. I carried you and I will carry you. Esa, not Nasati, that's in the past. Vaisa, I will carry you. This to the lesser is a comfort. How so? Because look what our God just did to his enemies. And the greater, to the greater, this is also a severe warning. How so? Because look what our God just did to his enemies. You see, one constant truth, it depends who you are and what level you are on and where you are standing. We're talking multidimensional over here. Meaning, tell Israel that they have seen my capabilities and tell them, to take what's coming next very, very seriously. Because what comes next? If you do not take upon yourselves what I'm about to give you, not by your own merit, so don't, you know, don't get all high and mighty, but by that of your forefathers who went through it for your sake, you will not be in covenant with me, and your end will be just like that of 
the Egyptians. Remember them? Hmm. Okay. As in, Moses ascended to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, So shall you say to the house of Jacob and to the sons of Israel, You have seen what I did to this group and to that group. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and I brought you to me. Moses is the supernal eagle, by the way. And God is stating still that he is the one who made all this happen. And I brought you or will bring you to me. I did this. And what is Eli to me has the same gimata, has the same numerical value as M, mother. Okay? Mother also is Ima, right? Bina, 50 levels. But the numerical value is 41. So you understand? Bring them to me, to me, to me. Now they are ready for the grand illumination. As in the 50th gate, that, that we've been discussing. Now they're right here, they're ready to receive everything. Okay, God, but it's like getting in an elevator, you're up to the 50th level. You just, the doors have yet to be open, but they're about to be. God is just going to wait for the right moment, obviously. And now, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you shall be to me a treasure out of all peoples, for mine is the entire earth. You see, if you don't obey, uh, obey me and keep my, co my covenant, you shall be like the rest of the peoples. Again, you have to read what is being said, who is being said, how is being said, and also what is not being said. This gives us a better idea. So here's a fun fact. Oh, you should be, excuse me, you should be a kingdom of princes. Mamlechet Kohanim, the translation is princes, it's, it's priests. And a holy nation. Now these are the words that you shall speak to the children of Israel. So here's a fun fact. If it wasn't for the golden calf, all of Israel were to be priests. Nevertheless, as far as the rest of the nations are concerned, we will be. In fact, we currently are. But let's explain what that means. And yet still, a kingdom of priests, celestial, and a holy nation, terrestrial, right? God's word does not return void. God says, you will be. Are we not? Will we not be? We will absolutely be. But what does this mean? And you can see this strongly hinted in verse 22. And also the priests who go near the Lord shall prepare themselves, lest the Lord wreak destruction upon them. This is over here. What, what Kohanim? There were no Kohanim yet, right? Aaron wasn't anointed as a priest until later on. So who are these guys? Who are these Kohanim? Our sages say that anyone who, is seclu who has secluded themselves from the world and engulfs themselves exclusively in the matters of serving God is referred to as a Kohen. These are the uh, Pulushim, the Pharisees. Lifrosh is to remove yourself from society. This is a Jewish people. We indeed are Mamlechet Kohanim. Now we're completely, or have been, getting completely assimilated and mixed up. And th this cannot be that God's word does not stand. So. Correction's got to come, obviously. We understand this. Or anyone leading from a position of authority. In this context, it's referring most likely to Aaron, Adav, and Avihu, and the 70 elders, as we are going to read. I believe that's in, in 22 or something. And Moses and Aaron and, and Adav, and Avihu, and the 70 elders, they ascended the mountain and they beheld the God of Israel. These are the Kohanim, even though they weren't the official Kohanim just yet comes from a place of power. And we can also gather this from 2 Samuel 18, uh, 8, 18, where it says, And Benayahu the son of Yehoiada was over the archers and the slingers, and David's sons were chief officers. That's the English. Look what the Hebrew says. Ubenayahu ben Yehoiada ve'akarti ve'apalti Ubnei David, the sons of David, Kohanim hayu. Were the sons of David, that's impossible. There's, there's a line of priesthoods, right? Of, you know, from Aaron and then the, uh, from the Tzadok family. But what does this mean? It means that David appointed his, son, his sons as ministers who hold senior positions. It sounds like he was doing favors, but he wasn't because they were qualified. Anyway, Sarim HaMekahanim B'Tafkid Bakhir. This is, uh, this is what we got right now, right? For instance, uh, in Israel, what's his name? Is the current prime minister? 
not a word. And in Hebrew we say, he is Rosh Hamem Shalah HaMekahen, HaMechahen, from Kohen. He is right now the uh, sitting in the place of authority. Now I'm going to read a few verses back from, uh, from the story of David over here in Samuel. <coughs> so you get some context and also hints of the kingdom of David that was and that will be. And this is after David was just kicking butt all over Israel, destroying all the enemies and raining authority down on them. And David made himself a name when he returned from smiting the Arameans in the Valley of Salt, 18,000 men. And he placed governors in Edom, which he destroyed. Throughout all of Edom, he placed governors and all of Edom became servants to David. This is something that's going to happen in the end of days. Right now, we are servants to Edom. And the Lord saved David wherever he went. And David reigned over all of Israel, and David administered justice and charity for all his people. Mishpat utzdaka. Mishpat. Judgment. Judgment. Din. Gvura. And charity, tzedakah, chesed. You see, this, this, this is a righteous leader. This is the balance. And Yoav, the son of Zeruiah, was over the host. And Yoshaphat, the son of Eliud, was the recorder. So we have uh, Mazkir. Mazkir is like, it's a, well, it's a, in modern day Hebrew, it's a secretary. But it wasn't, you know, it was a recorder. Take a note, okay? And Sadok, here we go. The Tzadokites from uh, the priesthood. And Sadok ben Achituv, and Achimelech ben Eviatar, Kohanim. And Achimelech, the son of Eviatar, were the priests. The Saria Sofer, and he Saria was a scribe. So we see the Tzadokites, they are they're the ones that from all the priestly families are the ones chosen. And Benao, the son of Yoyada, was over the archers and the slingers, and David's sons, Koanim Hayu. So now we have different contexts, right? So they were, we know from their names that they were actually the priests, and we know that the sons of David were not priests, obviously, because is something it's you can't buy a priesthood you'd have to just be born into it now is there any doubt that in the times of messiah the descendants of david will be in senior positions no because mashiach ben david is coming from zera david he's going to be in senior positions there's a whole new government that's being formed you are understand right now okay now we're here we're about to receive the torah and so like we said before if everyone does not want it, no one gets it. If everyone does not accept it and receives it, then it is not given. And if even but a few fall, then we all pay the price. To receive the Torah means to receive God. This is not something that can happen partially, but completely. This is not something that can happen individually, but in unison. Which is why... Moses came and summoned the elders of Israel and placed before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him. Right? He couldn't speak to all the six plus million people over there. He couldn't. It's not possible. So he gathered the he gathered the skinim, right? The elders, who are the reps of the people, the uncorruptible and uncorrupted lovers of truth and righteousness, leaders of the people. He's got my vote. Why? Because he's the chief of my tribe, whatever that is. And all the people replied in unison and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we shall do. And Moses took the words of the people back to the Lord. It's beautiful. And here we go. This had to happen before we got the Torah. And after three days of purification, the children of Israel are now ready to receive the law judgment, but coming from Hashem, Yud Kei Vav Kei, mercy. Also a hint towards the third day, which is Tiferet, right? Day one, Chesed, Gvura, Tiferet, third day, Tiferet, Torah, Jacob, here we go. The perfect balance of mercy and judgment. Coming right out of where? Boom, fire, judgment, which is why we read, God spoke all these words to respond. Vaydaber Elohim et kol advarim aile le'emor. And then, Anochi Hashem, the Yud Kei Vav Kei Mercy, Elohecha, here we go, judgment. Asher hotzeticha meretz Mitzrayim ibeit avadim. The law is judgment, but it ultimately comes from mercy. We'll see this. I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. 
אנוכי השם אלוהיך. I am myself alone mercy and judgment together. I am the connection between heaven and earth. I am heaven and earth. I am all things. And I have taken you out of the darkness that was the celestial Egypt from the clutches of slaves. What is this? The Egyptians themselves were in bondage. You see, you're going to read this differently now. They themselves were in bondage to the forces of darkness whom they fully embraced and became Egypt's people. That's why they were the Egyptians or a living manifestation of all that was unholy. Me'eret Mitzrayim Beit Avadim from the land of darkness, from the house of slaves, meaning that Israel were slaves of slaves. You were slaves coming from the house of slaves. That's where I took you out. Oh yeah, changes things, doesn't it? You, Israel, are not to do as they did. You shall not have the gods of others in my presence. It says, Al Panai, instead of my face, in front of me. Where is God? We are, he is before us all the time, right? It's not just in one, you're not limited to one area, because God just say, the whole world is mine. Where do you, where, how do we finish the last thing? Mitzrayim uh, Beit Avadim? Yeah, the whole world is mine. Mitzrayim Beit Avadim. It's all mine. I created them, I took them out, the whole world is mine. You could also read that in Psalms 24. Now I feel I need to address this part right here because the question has come up more than once, okay? <clears throat> While many teachers discuss this part that you should, in regards to other gods, they discuss this. I have yet to hear anyone discuss what comes next. <laughs> so I'm going to be trying to be a little bit bold, humbly bold over here and just uh, go with it. There are other, look at me, gods, okay? Meaning there are other beings with what seems to us supernatural power. Obviously, nothing in the universe has power if it is not given from God through God, period. So don't even, all right? But this is nothing new. Where do you think the Greek and Roman uh, mythology came from? Well, you think they made it up? Look what happened before the flood. You can read this in the Tsar. You could read this in the book of Jasher, uh, you, part, part, partly. Um, you, can read, uh, you can read it in Enoch. The gods who fornicate with women demigods right then they get them demigods titans giants half man half beast this isn't jasher there's no argument here this is all in the torah so cyclops vampires alpadim shadim ghosts ghouls goblins all this is also in the talmud these things exist in the world no one likes to talk about it because it's really uncomfortable but i like to because it's, it's fun. It's just, I mean, all right. <clears throat> because they are not human and have abilities, men worship them, right? Men worship other men of power. When you do this, you give that entity your power, your life force. You hand it over to them, and they do with it as they will. You see, if humans knew... Listen up now, human beings. If you knew, if we knew, you, we, me too, that we were more powerful than anything ever created, the picture would have been very, very different, but we choose to give our power away because we don't even realize our potential. That's the whole suppression. But our potential or willingness to fulfill it, that's entirely up to us. Which is why the world, as we know it, is making all the choices for you and telling you what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, and what's possible and what's not possible. So, nations that are not from the house of Jacob, from the children of Israel, you do whatever you want. Go right ahead. That's why the one true God, our God, the God and creator of all things, has given you these cute little distractions to keep you away from his people. This is how we are separate from all the nations. This is how we know who we are, and this is how we know who they are. You want to believe in a million gods? Have at it. You want to believe that a dude went up to heaven with his donkey? 
Knock yourself out. You want to believe that God became flesh? Go nuts. This is the understanding of this verse. But what they are not telling you is that this time, now, it's at an end. All these other, look at me, gods, which our God has allowed to exist, have all served a purpose. And that purpose is over and has been since last Rosh Hashanah. You can see it in the world. While in the past, when the nations have prayed to their gods, they might have gotten ant gods, yes, they might have gotten answers and even seen some miracles. That's enough to make people believe, right? I mean, we know that when we see people performing miracles, we don't follow them because God said, I'm testing you, so we know better. But the nations, they see a miracle, they're like, whoa, yeah, let's go after that one. But now the more that they pray to their gods, the more damage is going to come upon their own heads. And why? Because Zechariah 14, 9, And the Lord shall become king over all the earth. And on that day the Lord shall be one in his name, one. You see, in order for God's name to be one in all the earth, that means that every other god must be completely wiped out. No question. This is the existential crisis that I was telling you about that's on its way right now. And the same goes for the kingdom of Mashiach. There will be only one government. Again, you're, you're, I, I hear what you're saying. I feel you, right? But there, all other governments have to fall. All means all. This has been prophesied. There, nothing can stand. If something stands, you know that we're further away. So don't you want things to fall? Obviously, you want it to fall in a merciful way. But look at the world and let's get real. How's it going to come? So you can't change the world without changing yourself. Work on yourself. And this is what we're seeing right here, right now. This is valuable stuff. We all want the same thing, essentially. One government, one world order. Uh-oh, did I say the magic word? But it's not theirs. See, it's ours, or rather it's God's one world order. In fact, they are currently laying the groundwork beautifully. They, thems that are pulling them strings, they're laying the ground beautifully for God's kingdom. They just don't know it yet. Kind of like how Haman prepared, you know, the big, beautiful tree with a really nice, probably mostly likely uncomfortable noose for Mordechai, the Jew, to swing from. Hear me now, the tree that they are preparing is absolutely terrifying. It's tall, it's got no life on it, it's domineering, okay, it's dark, it's got, you know, you hear like organs playing in the background and bats coming out of it with rats all over the place. Maybe a bunch of spiders and cobwebs. But make no mistake, we will not be swinging from that tree. You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness which is in the heavens above, which is on the earth below, or which is in the water beneath the earth. Yes, there's water beneath the earth. And we're not talking about the oceans. There's different water, the waters of the deep. Because everything that is in the heavens and above and the earth and below the earth and the water and below the water, I did that. So if you want to worship anything that I created, go ahead. But understand and never forget who created that which you worship. As for you, Israel, this is how you know who you are. You know where the word Pesel comes from? Graven image, statue, idol, whatever. You know where it comes from? It comes from the word Psolet. Pesel, Psolet, waste, trash, garbage. The, um, the excrement of the body. That's what is, it's called Psolet in High Hebrew. While Israel received the true revelation of God and His Torah, the other entities that are worshipped, they suckle from the garbage of what has been thrown away. This is how they get their powers, so to speak, because it is garbage. 
What the nations are then doing is suckling from the waste of the parasites who suckle from the waste. Do you understand? All that's going to be gone. And out of this waste, they make images for themselves. And so we are not like the nations. You shall neither prostrate yourself before them, nor worship them. Don't do any of this stuff. Let them do it. It's fine. Let them do it. Not you. For I, the Lord your God, am a zealous God, who visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons and upon the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Anyone who believes that anyone else has any power whatsoever other than the God of Israel will stand corrected soon enough. That's an impossibility. You, you see? Understand this. There is no power in the world other than God himself. Period. That's it. The reason anything else exists, be it perceived as good or bad, is because God has a purpose for it. There are no mistakes. There are no coincidences. There are no accidents. And he's not giving us the understanding here in the plain text, but the command, should we follow it, will lead to this coveted understanding. I would say necessary understanding, because if you don't know that you don't understand, how do you know that you're not even understanding? See the nations. This is why the nations will never understand, because they don't follow this. They don't even know how to read this. I'm reading a kosher English translation, and it's wrong. From Orthodox Jewish sources, and it's a lot of these, it, it just gets lost. You can't. It's not even their fault. You, there's so much here. Who visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons, upon the third or fourth generation of those who hate me? Even those who hate me will be given an opportunity to do tshuva. Is that what I just said? If you read this, even in the Hebrew, you won't understand. If not while they're alive, then up to three, four generations after them. Meaning that God's kindness and mercy extends beyond a person's death. As we know very well from King David, Psalms 115, 17. Neither will the dead praise God, nor all those who descend to the grave. Lo hametim ya hallelujah velo chol yerdei Duma. Remember that class about Duma when Abraham was uh, purchasing the plot of land to bury Sarah? I like that teaching. It's fun for me. After we die, that's it. We can no longer gain any merit. Because once we die, we are in absolute truth. The, the whole, there's no this way or that way. And then there's no evil inclination. And if there's no evil inclination, then there is no resistance. Once the final tikkun is made by Mashiach ben David, there will be no conversions for exactly the same reason. There's no merit to convert once the truth is absolute, right? You could, I could say I know that there, I know the absolute truth. I could say that now, right? Theoretically speaking, okay? Even though, but theoretically speaking, I could say, yeah, I know absolute truth. Yet. I, ha I still have a Yetzir Hara, and I still have temptations all around me, inside me, all around me. This is the world. This is by design. Every moment that I overcome these temptations, I inch closer, uh, closer to the truth. So, <clears throat> now, when one dies, when a person dies, in his sins, let's say, or, um, you know, or if that person would like a little extra kick to ascend in heaven, this is where the next three generations come in. This is why when someone dies, we say Kaddish over them for 11 months. And if they're a really wicked person, a Jew, obviously, for 12 months. Not obviously a Jew, a wicked person. Who am I? You need to understand what I'm saying here. In order to elevate their souls by praising God in their stead. I also give a, a teaching on that. When a person dies, we say Kaddish. And Kaddish has nothing to do <clears throat> with the dead. Kaddish, to blessing. We bless God. Why do we bless God? Because the Jew who just died can no longer do it, so we do it in their stead. It's a beautiful connecting the chain, picking up the slack, and we elevate that person's soul. Take Korach, for example. He died in his sins. We all know the story. We're going to go through it. In fact, it said that he was taken to the sixth realm of Gehenom, hell, which is Sheol. But look what happened to his sons. Psalms 48 
שיר מזמור לבני קורח, a song, a psalms of the sons of קורח. The Lord is great and very much praised in the city of our God, the mount of his sanctuary. Furthermore, the great prophet Samuel, the anointer of kings, he is of the descendants of קורח. Because his children did not follow in their father's footsteps, they have brought a form of redemption to his name and his neshama. And in the end of days, Korach will rise like the righteous as the palm tree, and his sins will be white as snow. So said Moses, Tzadik Atamari Frach. And this is according to Moses' Psalms, which uh, we also discussed this one in the past. Mizmor Shir Liyom HaShabbat, the four first letters over there say Lemoshe. As in to Moses, he sings about the Shabbat. We're also going to learn about that. You'll see beautiful connection. So you see, while the nations will read this and not understand how God could be so cruel, oh, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers for three or four. God is God cruel, but the Torah, even though it might seem that's being given through judgment, it's coming for mercy. So chas v'shalom, God is not cruel here. Who visits the iniquity in the f- of the father, fathers upon the sons, upon the third and fourth generation of those who hate me? We read this knowing how God works and understand that it is not iniquity that God visits upon the sons, but rather the opportunity to redeem their fathers. The nations know nothing of redemption. Nothing. It, I mean, again, just l- look at the different theologies, if you will. But, in other words, if the sons do tshuva, they fix the past. But there is a time limit, specifically for those of Israel who it says, who hate God, meaning purposefully throw away the very Torah that is being given to us, knowing exactly what they do. And still for them, there is a time to come back for three or four generations after they die. But after time is up, it says the root of that person gets cut off from Israel and they will not be resurrected. But <clears throat> is that not the name of the game after all? Are we not tasked with redeeming the sin of Adam? This is why the world is. This is why we're doing everything that's happening right now. And I perform loving kindness to thousands of generations. Here now God's talking about kindness to thousands of generations right after this, you, you see? If you don't know what you're reading, if you don't have that understanding, you, you don't have the understanding. To those who love me, hate me, love me, and to those who keep my commandments. As we have discussed, we are nowhere close to a thousand generation from the days of Adam until today. I think we're, what was it like 512, 514? Up until our current timeline. So as far as we're concerned, in this iteration of existence, a thousand generations means forever. And so know this. Even in the worst of all the generations of the house of Jacob, there have always been those who love God and keep his commandments, and that is enough to carry the generation itself, even if there's one. You see how that works. One could bring us down and one could lift us up. It's a very cool system. Tricky, but very cool, but we're working on it. Now, up until this point, God spoke directly to the people with no filter, the first two commands, which is why they died and had to be resurrected after every utterance. They could not handle God speaking to them directly. It says that the heavens folded down as God descended. It was just, it was too much. You cannot have this. And God spoke to them in the way that he speaks to Moses on a regular basis. However, Moses was the only one who was capable of actually having a conversation. You know, it was a dialogue. We can see the change in the form from the first person to the third person, right? You shall not take the name of the Lord, your God, in vain. Now, Moses is clearly speaking. uh, For the Lord will not hold blameless anyone who takes his name in vain. The sages have asked the question as to why it says you shall not take or carry, it says tisa, the Lord's name in vain, as opposed to swearing his name in vain. Because in Leviticus 19.12, when it sort of goes through the commands in a certain way, you can see, it says, You shall not swear falsely by my name, velotishbe'u bishmi l'shakel, l'shakel, lying, thereby profaning the name of your God, I am the Lord. The uh, swearing in this regard (coughs) to using God's holy name is through the angels, which is not permitted in any case. In other words, 
you you don't swear through angels, you don't swear through people, even if angels are sent by God. This is not done. But in the Ten Commandments, this is in regards to anyone who changes anything from God's name. Now you might be thinking, let's say the four-letter name of Hashem, but it's not uh, the entire Torah that's the name of God. But guess what? The entire Torah is the name of God. And the entire Torah is also all of Israel. We are all a letter from the Torah. And so it's not only if one changes the Torah that is said in the verse, for the Lord will not hold blameless anyone who takes his name in vain, meaning that there's no coming back from that, but using the Torah itself against God, or in other words, applying it to promote idolatry. It's according to sages. And this is, um, and this is what they were alluding to. Now I say alluding, but basically... They spoke directly of this command. This is what is said. A Jew is not permitted to teach Torah to a Gentile because that's like handing something that is holy, which is the name of God, the Torah, over to the Kalipa. Furthermore, this will cause the Gentile to come up with their, this was written a long time ago, to come up with their own books. I wonder what they could be talking about. Against the word of God, right? The extension seems to be canceling out the old. And his punishment is great because he causes those gullible fools, that's a language, to believe what they are writing. And this is as if he is handing them the sword to kill us. And this is even apparent in the verse itself. Lo shem Hashem Elohecha Lashav. You shall not take the name of the Lord uh, the name of the Lord your God in vain. Shem Hashem. Shem is the name of Yud Kei Vav Kei. Shem, God's name, has the same numerical value as Sefer, book. You shall not take God's book, and which is his name, in vain. Meaning that God and his Torah are one. And if you disrespect the Torah, you disrespect God. And your punishment is the same. Now, this was and still is halacha. Meaning, listen, meaning, this is, this gets spicy over here. Meaning, a Jew is not permitted by any means to teach Torah to the nations. However, right? Okay, listen now. I teach Torah to Jews and Gentiles alike. I know this. First of all, I can't control who watches the teachings, but I say right now, I am proudly teaching Torah to anyone and everyone that wants to learn. Am I going against halacha? No, I am not. How could this be? Remember we discussed the shift? Okay, we shift from within because it seems like it's happening externally, but when we seek and understand the truth and cleave to it, we cease to shift as far as the world is concerned. We're, stopped, we're, we're not turning anymore. We are now with the constant that doesn't move. Now pay attention. Did Eliyahu, Elijah, break halacha when he sacrificed the bulls on Mount Carmel? Once the temple was built, you were not allowed to build an altar or sacrifice to God anywhere else but from the temple. But Elijah did just that. Did he transgress the word of God? Nope. In fact, he did it for the sake of sanctifying the name of God. Now, this was a one-time thing. There have been other instances of Jews going directly against Halacha for the sake of of halacha. There are other instances in the Torah as well. We won't get into that today. And the Ramchal explains it with such, like, mamash with kid gloves. He's saying, I'm not saying that you should take from this at all anything, nor should you replicate this. This was only allowed for this person to do that thing at that exact moment in time, which went completely against the Torah, but that person did it. This is how he explains it. And these are far and few between. These are moments in time that are designated for a specific person to do a specific thing that might go contrary directly against the Torah. We're talking about one person, one thing, and that's it. But this is not for us to decide. That's why we don't touch it. We definitely don't want to, you know, those kind of decisions on our heads anyway. Now, one of the most significant times that a Jew went against halacha, not only against halacha, but against all those that, all the poskim, the ones who write the halacha, that is not well known, but absolutely should be, because, well, we'll see, this is Mordechai, right? Mordechai the Jew, Mordechai Yehudi. 
he went against the entire Sanhedrin, the same body that Moses set up, that has been suggested right here in this parsha by Jethro, which had been sanctioned by God. How can you go against all the Sanhedrin? This is a clear halacha that is written in the Torah, and Mordechai defied the verdict of the Sanhedrin. What they say goes, period. Even if they are wrong, it says in the Talmud, even if the minority are wrong, you have to follow the majority because it has been sanctioned by God, and God knew exactly what everybody would choose, and he says, it's okay. But in this case, he went against that. What happened as a result? The Jewish people were saved. He told Esther that if the Jews don't start fasting on Passover, which is another breaking of halacha, by the way, you do not fast on Passover, Shabbos, or any joyous occasion. Absolutely not. These are the Lord's days. They're not your days to start feeling sorry for yourself, right? Start fasting on Passover. They said if you don't start fasting on Passover, crying out to God through fasting and prayer, sackcloth and ash, in order to, for three days, in order to preserve the, uh, to reverse the verdict that had already been decreed in the heaven to destroy all the Jews, there would be no more Jews to follow halacha. So nothing would be relevant. Mordechai went against the explicit word of God in order to save the Jewish people. And what happened as a result? It is said that in the new world, all the holidays will be gone because they won't be needed to glorify God anymore. Why would we need Yom Kippur if all our sins are gone, you understand? Why would we need to re remember Yetziat Mitzrayim and Pesach when we know, we already uh, read in the prophets, that what is to come by Mashiach will be even greater than the Exodus. But the story of Purim will always and forever be celebrated. You see this? I teach Torah to Gentiles, and I will not apologize for that. And believe me, I got questions. I get questioned for this, and I get uh, flack for it by other Jews who don't get it. I just feel bad for them because they don't get it, but that's okay. They're stuck in a box. I say, what box? There is no box. Unfortunately, what's in the box? Nothing. Unfortunately, I have seen many Gentiles take what I have taught and completely spin it in a way that makes me want to bang my head against the wall. I'm sitting here reading some things that people are writing, people are saying in regards to my teachings. Try and understand, like, wait, I said this. How did they get to that? I, I, I don't know. And then I realized this has nothing to do with me. I can only do what I've been called to do for now for as long as I've been called to do it. I teach Torah to the world. That's my job. But I also know why I'm doing it. I think again you here here's the fruit it's those messages and it's those emails that i get from those who have come out of christianity out of messianic judaism who see the truth i don't tell them they're like i see it and what you are saying i understand wow here's your understanding it's not my job to explain the truth i can't do it i just teach it if it hits you it hits you if not it's okay god loves you you just got a different path Everyone understands what they want, how they want, and there's nothing that anyone can do to change that from large things to small things. I deal with it every day, believe me. Logic has nothing to do with this. Those who get it have already gotten it. And that's only because God has called them back to the fold, those who convert, of course meaning that they are of the lost tribes, meaning that they are of Israel. This is what, and this is what is called, okay, this thing right now we're teaching uh, Gentiles Torah, it's one of the four revolutions, and I'll explain this. The there are four revolutions. The first revolution is writing down the oral law. The second is taking money for teaching Torah. The third is teaching women, to is teaching women Torah, and the fourth is teaching Gentiles Torah. Let's explain briefly. The first revolution, okay? Writing down the oral law, the oral Torah. From the time of Moses up until Rabbi Udanasi, who wrote the Mishnah, the oral Torah, there was an absolute prohibition to do so. The reason that you didn't write it down was to not limit the living Torah to words on a page. It was discussions. They wouldn't sit there with books. They would speak. And again, there, it was a different time in the world 
less distraction, more Ruach HaKodesh. There was an understanding. It was in their blood. It was what they did. They, they lived and breathed it. This is all they did. Different place. Okay? <clears throat> However, through Ruach HaKodesh, which only comes from God, Rabbi Udanasi foresaw that if we do not record everything that is spoken and debated, it will be gone completely from the Jews and from the world, especially after the destruction of the Second Temple. And guess what? He was absolutely right. If it wasn't for his defiance, and again, he, he was the shot caller too, but he did something and took it upon himself to go against the word of God, yet he did it, the Torah, and if he would not have done it, the Torah would have been separated from Israel. So it's a good thing, right? Two, the second is taking money for teaching Torah. Since the days of Issachar, who was studying Torah, while Zebulun was supporting him, this proper exchange was permissible, right? But as the times went on, less and less people could be fully supported by the study of Torah. Exiles and whatnot, right? But if you could combine the two, while the main focus would be to study for the sake of teaching, one could accept payment for the sake of sustenance. I'm doing this so you can do that, and this is all I got, so you pay me that. I get bread, you get spiritual bread, everybody's happy, and the cycle goes on. Again. These are, uh, this, all these are taking place right now in the final exile. So this is a, another thing that was once prohibited, but now is permissible. Three, the third is the teaching Torah to women. <clears throat> now this is something that only came to pass a little over a hundred years ago. It's not that women were not allowed to study Torah because they would study at home with, you know, with their mothers and everything. But the question was to open houses of study specifically for women. Just like there are yeshivot for men, there are midrashot for women. This is what you do. You're going to go and you're going to study Torah. And not just in regards to the mitzvot that they have to perform, but in all matters, just like men, you're going to study all things, the same as men, as men study. In most cases, when it comes to practical halachot, women have a much better understanding than men do. <laughs> Trust me. And if you look at how the uh, status and self-respect of women has fallen in the eyes of the Torah over the last century, look at, you know, just look at women today, for goodness sakes. It's understandable that by not allowing this, but strongly promoting it has saved thousands of daughters of Israel from going astray. If you start occupying yourself with Torah, you're less likely to look like, how shall we say this really nicely, a prostitute when you go outside. Okay, so the fourth is uh, teaching Gentiles Torah. If I didn't hear the great Rabbi Ginsburg teach this and the reasoning behind it, I would not have believed it. Now, as of the last few years, it has been uh, permissible, just the last few years, permissible to teach Torah, Halacha, Kabbalah, and everything pertaining to it to the Gentiles. Now, why do you think that is? We got two reasons. The first is that um, it's going to call out to those who need to return home, right? I can say from experience that you throw, you know, you put those beacons out there, those hooks out there, and people, the relevant people, they catch like, you know, like fish. And second, all the idolatry that had been permissible up till now is no longer permissible, even for the Gentiles. They just don't know yet, but they're going to finally, on their own, they're going to understand, wait a minute, what we've been doing up until now is no longer working. Like I told you, that which has saved your life up until now is going to kill you. This is not to say that the Gentiles should keep the mitzvot. This is not allowed. That's not what I'm talking about. But learn them and see what happens. See what happens, right? And what is the reason for this? Because we are very close to the coming of Messiah. And how are the Gentiles going to know who or what Mashiach is if they continue reading their own books that they wrote? They're just going to know that. Existential crisis. So technically speaking, according to what was, I'm putting myself and every Gentile I teach in, in danger, according to the halacha that was. But practically, 
These are the times, and God has blessed me with seeing the wonderful fruit, and that is you guys. And that's why I continue. Uh, remember the Sabbath, the Sabbath day to sanctify it. Zachol at Yom HaShabbat Lekotsho. I'm just, I'm very happy just thinking about this. It's, just, it's, it's not a prideful thing, it's a humble thing. When I get these emails, ask Anna Rina, I start to cry. It's like, mm. ah, okay. Anyway, remember these three aspects in regards to Shabbat. Thought, speech, action. This is also the unification between the celestial male and female aspect of creation. Now, if you missed it, in Genesis, we discussed how God created the entire universe according to male and female, after each after their own kind, which are equal but not the same. Each has their own unique and specific function, and they cannot be complete without each other. Someone should give this as a refresher course to the world, huh? Nah, I didn't think so. HaShabbat, the, sh the Shabbat is female. She's a queen. Shabbat HaMalka. And what else is a queen if not Malchut? While Lekadsho, not Lekadsha. Lekadsho translates to sanctify him. It says it, but again it's wrong. Lekadsho, male tense. And this is the unity between the aspects of male and female. <coughs> How do we welcome Shabbat in the aspect of thought? This is something Gentiles can partake in as well, and you probably should. Learn about Shabbat and its importance. When the time comes in, sunset on Friday night, understand that this is where creation ended. Because the Shabbat was not created. Where does it say that? Six days of creation. Shabbat always was. Understand that the six days of creation correspond with the 6,000 years of the world's existence. And we're almost at the end. And the Shabbat is but a glimpse of the new world to come. Where there will be nothing but Shabbat. In speech, how? We sing Kabbalat Shabbat. We sing to our wives, we sing the Kiddush, the special, uh, uh, special uh, psalms and songs. We welcome the Shabbat, Lechadodi and everything, Shalom Aleichem, uh, with the high hidden codes instilled within the words. How do we do it in action? Technically speaking, there is no action on Shabbat, but rather actively resting. And resting from what? The actions that prepare us for the Shabbat, which is done during the six days. Six days you shall work and perform all your labor. For what? For Shabbat. You have to get everything done. Six days, 6,000 years, you must get everything done. Because the Shabbat is upon us. Which is why even the six days that you must work are to prepare for the Shabbat. And in the grand scale of things, the work that we do our whole lives is to prepare us for the world to come. During the, uh, the six days, there is power and permission for external forces to interfere. And this is precisely our work to correct that which needs correcting and to dispose of that which needs disposing. Once this is done properly, there you can you know, really rest on Shabbat because during that time, they do not have permission. Now it's, it's a closed, you're in a bubble, it's a closed space, time slows down. <coughs> it does. We used to love Shabbat in the army, <laughs> especially in the army. I mean, everyone, religious, secular alike, doesn't matter. See, while Shabbat was taking place, the drill sergeants were not allowed to touch you. If you look at them wrong, if you do something wrong, they're like, I'm going to write this down. I know exactly when Shabbat is coming out, right? But the moment the job is ended, you could count like 10, 9, 8, right? After it's done, then it's on like Donkey Kong. As the sun sets, everybody starts getting depressed and stressed for what's to come. They're like, yo, man, they're going to kill us. They're going to kill us. We're already putting on our, our uh, uniforms and everything because we know we do our stretches. We're like, here he comes. It's, and it always does. Like clockwork. Those dudes never disappointed. And that is why we say that Israel live from Shabbat to Shabbat. We all have our own Shabbat stories throughout our lives. Let the Muslims have their Friday. Let the Christians have their Sunday. Whatever. This is all by design. But the seventh day is a, is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. 
<clears throat> you shall perform no labor, neither you, your son, your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, your beast, nor your stranger who is in your cities. Look we'll at it. Your son, your daughters. Obviously, your sons are your daughters. So why does it even say this? Because this refers to children under the age of mitzvah. When a girl turns 12, she is now a bat mitzvah. She takes the, um, the um, yoke of the mitzvot upon her, which means sin can also come there as well. Same thing, bar mitzvah 13 for a boy. So here we are referring to even 12-year-old kids, 10-year-olds, 8-year-olds, kids who understand, but also small children as well. Little kids. I, I knew since I can remember that Shabbat was different, right? Two years old or whatever. Everything was different. The smells, the lights, the clothing, the habits. It was it was special. It was exciting. You know? That's it was this is how I remember it. It was in Staten Island. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm sure anyone who for the first time joined an Orthodox family for a meal. No phones, no TVs, no social media, look what I'm doing, none of that stuff, okay? No electronics of any kind, as they are all prohibited. You don't turn on or off the lights. There is singing, there is praying, there is blessing, there is thanking. It's a good time. Your manservants, your maidservants, your beast. I forgot which partial we discussed it in, but this alludes to so much more than what it says. As these, uh, as these, your manservants, your maidservants, and your beasts have spiritual counterparts in the heavens, as they are your extension here in the world. There's got to be a redemption for all of them. There's a reason that they are your manservants, your maidservants, and your beasts. Nor your stranger who is in your cities. This is a bad translation. <clears throat> it says, nor the ger who is in your gates. Now, we know that there are two types of gerim, as we've discussed. There's a ger toshav, meaning a foreigner who dwells within your borders, which is no longer relevant to today's times because we don't have the kingdom, right? And then there's a ger tzedek, a righteous ger, meaning one who fully converts to Judaism, according to Orthodox, because nothing else is recognized. Don't worry, we'll talk about that. Not today, but um, yeah, Bezrat Hashem will set the record finally straight. <clears throat> But we know that once you convert, you have to keep Shabbat just like all the Jews, because now you're a Jew, right? So why does it say it over here? Just in case the Ger themselves might have any doubts as to where they stand, come in from the gates, which is what? Malchut. And join us. There is no doubt as to where you belong. And this way, all of Israel, with all their dominion, and all within their dominion, young and old, servant, slave, and beast, must partake on the Shabbat, because they will all partake in the Shabbat. And this is your full circle. Just like that. As God now brings up the creation itself and another reason, an element for us to remember. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it. Vayikad Shehu. You see, if you don't do the proper work during the six days, then you won't be ready for Shabbat. You cannot be. There is Shabbos preparation. This is your life. And if you are, and it's fading one moment at a time, and if you are not ready for Shabbat, you will not be able to partake in it. And if you are not able to partake in it in this world, then you are not being conditioned for the eternal Shabbat of the world to come. You have to understand, everything that has ever been created has an expiration date. There's a time limit on everything, except for a few things we'll discuss. For instance, what are the elements of which the world, the earth, is created? Earth, wind, fire, and water, correct? What about man? Same thing. Man is made of the same elements in this physical world. So we know that man will end as well. Did God, uh, did God not create the soul though, right? So the physical body will end, but not the soul. Now, in a way... <coughs> What is the soul of man if not the breath of God? You see, there's a part of us that will never end, that is eternal, because it was not created, but rather it is a part of. Meaning that our souls are a part of God himself, 
and for that our souls are infinite. We shed the finite, we remain with the infinite. And this is why in this world we are called to connect the part of us that is infinite through that which is infinite to that which is infinite. You get it? I'll say again. We are called to connect the part of us that is infinite, our souls, through that which is infinite, the Torah, to that which is infinite, the Shabbat and God. Is the Torah infinite? Yes, it is also part of God. Is the Shabbat infinite? Does it say anywhere that God created the Shabbat? Meaning that the Torah and the Shabbat are also all connected because they always were here. They are part of God. Infinite is not something that was ever created. It's not that it has a beginning. It never had a beginning. And so God gave us our souls. So we connect them through the commands of the Torah to the Shabbat and to be unified with the infinite. Echad, one everything else will pass away so what are you connecting to yourself what are you connecting yourself to while you are in this world while you still have a chance and another hint in the verse for in six days the lord made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and he rested on the seventh day therefore the lord blessed the sabbath day and sanctified it where do we see in the commands thus far that god brings in the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them you shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness which is in the heavens above, which is in the earth below, or which is in the waters beneath the earth. Meaning, if you keep the Shabbat, then the Shabbat will keep you from idolatry, being like the rest of the nations. This is what separates everybody. And look at the world today and see who does not keep Shabbat, and then you know who they are, and that is idolatry. It's very simple. It's not a problem if it's the uh, Gentiles, but it's a very big problem if it's not kept by Israel. The Gentiles are not called to keep Shabbat. It's not a sin for them to not keep the Shabbat. Remember the Shabbat, recognize the Shabbat, sure. But the mitzvot and Shabbat, that is exclusively for Israel. As it says, between me and the children of Israel, ot olam, it is an eternal sign. Oh yeah, that means only Israel and that means eternal, forever, because it will never, ever end, because that is Shabbat. Now, there are Ten Commandments written on two tablets. There. <laughs> that is better. Um, that's because when I was Moses. <clears throat> now, we're coming up to the fifth in a minute, the fifth commandment. So I just want to make a distinction over here between the two tablets. The two tablets represent Leah and Rachel, who are the mothers of the children of Israel. Again, the world was created for Israel. Nekudah. Leah is on the right, as she represents the higher and more concealed aspects of God, which is what we're going through right now, which the rest of the world is not, does not have to partake in, which is um, very apparent by the commands themselves. It's between God and man. And Rachel represents the left tablet and those who are the ways of God revealed. Very basic ways, right? I mean, basic, but we'll see. It's like, who's on the right? The right is uh, Yehuda, Judah, David, the lion. And on the left side is Yosef, Leah, and Rachel. I'm doing it for, for you, the right and left side. Okay, where are we? <clears throat> this will get you through the world, meaning the, the five left commands, the, the five ending commands. And they, they're fairly simple on the surface, that is, as we discussed. The five shall nots are also included within the seven Noahide laws, by which the whole world is required to live. Which is why this specific command can be considered somewhat of an anomaly. Honor your father and your mother, in order that your days be lengthened on the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Honor your father and your mother. Anyone can do that. In fact, everyone should do that. Honor your father and your mother in order that your days be lengthened. I'm sure that there are plenty of individuals who have done this and have not necessarily had long lives. Honor your father and your mother in order that your days be lengthened on the land. What land? Earth? Honor your father and your mother in order that your days be lengthened on the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Giving who? Israel. What land? The land of Israel. But does that mean that if you are honoring your parents only not in the land of Israel, you get no merit? Of course not. Because Israel are, tried, are tied to the land of Israel. And that is the supernal Adama. There's also supernal Eretz. 
that is connected to each Jew no matter where they are. And the Adama is also known as the Shekhinah, which is in exile with us currently. The Shekhinah was weeping when we got taken to Babylon. The Shekhinah was in captivity as well. So you see the three partners in creating life are the father, the mother, and of course God. As we've just discussed the aspect of male and female in all things. But in this specific case, your parents are a conduit to connecting with God because God has given them you. See? And it's also a link between God and between man. That's why it's the fifth command. And if you break that conduit, don't expect much. So what is this length of days? It is what you think it is. Because of your actions in the physical realm, through the conduit and order that God created, we will reside in the land, the Shekhinah of God, forever, even once the earth will pass away. You shall not murder. Next. Transition. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So let's break it down to basics. Literally. You shall not murder. What is the most valuable possession of man in this world? It ain't your iPhone. It's his life, more so than his wealth or anything else. I say in the world, world. Wealthy people who are dying would give away their fortunes to get healthy. And so, in the basic world, I, I say basic right now, that is the first thing that has to be addressed. Also, this is very important to note, your life as it is, not your nefesh, but your goof, your body. Okay, this is what we're talking about. Because there are people who love quoting Deuteronomy 4.15 incorrectly. I might add that says, And you shall watch yourselves very well. That's how it's translated. This has nothing to do with bodily harm. Listen up, this is an education. Nothing. How could it be? Read the verse. Ki lo For you did not see any image on that day that the Lord spoke to you at Choreb from the midst of the fire. Read all the commentaries on this. And if it's about idolatry, and if you need someone to tell you not to jump off a cliff or a roof or run into the street or purposefully run into harm's way, you're an idiot. And what do you learn? You got no reason learning Torah. Don't go and do bodily harm to yourself. Gee, I'm glad the Torah told me that. Otherwise, I was gonna. You see, nowhere does it say that you need to keep your body safe over doing the right thing. Nowhere in the Torah. The Torah does not promote bodily safety, okay, as a primal. Your body doesn't even belong to you. What you do with your body, that's a different story. Are you going to put on tefillin or not? Are you going to use your legs and your hands and your brain for good things or not? In fact, it's quite the opposite, especially when it comes to Judaism, right? So I hope this sets the record straight. Just trust me, this needed to be said. If you murder, you will be murdered. Because this is also a supernal thing as well as a physical thing. We were all made in God's likeness and God's image, right? So what's next on our, after looking out for our own skin? Number one, right? Yeah, thou shalt not kill, you shall not commit adultery. Technically speaking, in the ideal world, the most important thing in a man's possessions, and I tread very lightly here, just go with it, is his wife. Okay? Okay. The man's wife is also considered his pride, his honor. Now, we know, according to God, what the hierarchy is, a man's own life, his wife. Right? That's how it works. In other words, not necessarily per se his wife, but also his pride. I will, people will forego their pride just to live. They'll forego their pride for a whole lot less. Anyway, what comes next? His stuff. You shall not steal. As Jews, we know that on Rosh Hashanah, it has already been determined, signed, and sealed exactly how much we are going to acquire throughout that year. If God gives your neighbor more than he gave you or different than he gave you or something that you might want and you take it, it's more than just your neighbor that you're stealing from. 
as you are now messing up the order of things, to which there must be made recompense. And this sets off a domino effect. That's why people are killing each other all the time. If you are guilty of murder, someone has to murder you. And that someone that murders you will get murdered and so on and so forth. Look at the world today. All of these thou shall nots are happening running free. No surprise. And it all has been this way since the days of Noah. You can go back even earlier to Cain and Abel, right? Cain killed Abel, then he was killed and so on. But we're closer after the point of the flood, once new civilization, post-historic, prehistoric. Okay. <clears throat> you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Listen to this one. When a person gives false testimony, when they lie, what, what they do is, they give permission for everything that is a lie and false to enter into their lives. They're opening up gateways that they have no idea what they're messing with. Infecting everything they do, everything they touch, these people cannot be trusted and are so consumed with their own lies that they created a world for themselves according to their own likeness and their own image. If that's not idolatry, I don't know what is. They have been given a spirit of deceit as a result, as we saw with, uh, with the Book of Kings. And remember, everything will have to be undone publicly. Everything's going to be known. And that is a process that one should dread to go through. Now, why would a person not be truthful? Perhaps if they desire a specific outcome that does not fit their reality. And so, you shall not cover covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Because what begins with coveting will continue on to lying, conspiring, theft, and murder. You see how that works? The reason God began with murder is because if you think about it, you feel so far removed from you. Murder. I didn't kill anybody, but behold the slippery slope. You can also kill, per, kill a person by lashonara, by speaking against them. You kill them while they're still alive. You can swindle them out of all their money and keep them dirt poor. That's also like killing a person. But also this also means to straight up blood murder, right? Once we get these uh, five right here, I don't know a man or woman alive that has not fallen even a bit into these categories myself included, even if you are not aware, man, that's a nice car that lucky SOB has there. Whatever, right? What seems to be the problem, officer? Do you know how fast you were going? No, you see, I was this or that. I mean, who wouldn't lie to try to get out of a ticket? Yes, you're right. I broke the law and I will gladly take this ticket. You're doing a great job, officer, right? And if you did manage to talk your way to lie your way out of the ticket, you'd probably pat yourself on the back for it too. Pfft, I did a good job right there. My point is this. Whatever you do will always come first, full circle right back on your head. Full circle right back on your head. This is the world. This is how it works unless you do tshuva and you stop it right then and there. Now, as we know, these Ten Commandments are the basis to the 613 mitzvot which have been expounded upon in the Oral Law. This is why we need the Oral Law. This is why Rabbi Udanasi did good. And while the nations are busy doing their thing, God gave us that which is eternal, the Torah. And Israel, back then, like most Gentiles who are considering conversion, usually have the same reaction after hearing these things. And that is of sheer terror. You mean I have to do all those things? I have to take it all out upon myself? Oh no, I, that's too much. I say I like my cheeseburgers too much. You understand? No, no, I'm, I'm good over here. I'm good over here. What did Moses say? But Moses said to the people, Fear not, for God has come in order to exalt, we'll get to that, you, and in order that his awe shall be on your faces so that you shall not shine. Uh, sin, excuse me. What does the Hebrew say? Vayom Moshe Elam, Al Tirau, don't be afraid, ki le ba'avur nasot etchem. Nasot etchem is not spelled with a sin, like laset etchem. It is not exalt, lift, or carry. This is not naso. The word, the word is with the samech. And this comes from the word nisayon. Ba'avur nasot etchem. Nisayon, as in 
ויהי אחר הדברים האלה, והאלוהים נישא את אברהם. ויאמר אליו אברהם, ויאמר הנני. And it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. As the descendants of Abraham, we are given the opportunity to be tested as well. This is an opportunity. So let's read this again properly, shall we? But Moses said to the people, Fear not, for God has come in order to test you, in order that his awe shall be upon your face, so that you shall not sin. In other words, if you don't get with the program, sinning is inevitable. Did that help them back then, despite everything they witnessed? The people remained far off. It didn't work back then, and it's not working today. So what happened? When Moses drew near to the opaque darkness where God was, what's going to happen in the end of days, where people are still going to stay far off? That opaque darkness is going to come upon the people. What are you going to do? And if you're not with the program, it's going to bring terror and judgment. And what else does it say? How does it say here? We know that Am is the lowest form of the people of Israel. And they were afraid. Okay? Am, Am Ha'aretz. Making excuses, doing what they want, putting it on other oh, Moses, you, you gotta, and you know, hoping for the best. Ah, oh, Hashem Yazo. What are you doing about it that God will help? Are you doing your Hishtadlut? Seriously. But no one is getting off that easy. And we are God's chosen ones after all. And we will be made holy one way or another. We say this several times throughout the day, especially after a learning Torah right before Kaddish and prayer. If we have a quick shiur in between, the Gabbai gets up and he says the following, right? Rabbi Hananya ben Akasha Omer, Ratzah Kadosh Baruchu, Lezakot et Israel, Lefichach Yerba Lahem Torah Mitzvot, Shenemar, Adonai Chafetz Leman, Sidko, Yagdil Torah Veyadir. And that's when we say Kaddish, and that's when we get into the davening part. Rabbi Hananya ben Akasha says, The Holy One, this is in the uh, Masechet uh, Makot, Mishnah 316. The Holy One, blessed be He, sought to confer merit upon Israel. Therefore, He increased for them Torah and mitzvot. You want to know why 613? As each mitzvah increases merit. As it states in Isaiah 42, 21, it pleased the Lord for the sake of His righteousness to make the Torah great and glorious. You see, here's the thing. And this is how we began this whole shir. My spiel in the beginning. You still with me? Maybe? We're looking at it all wrong. It's not about all the Jews performing all the mitzvot. I don't know if that's even possible, but rather about every Jew performing one mitzvah perfectly. You see? According to the Rambam, Maimonides, when one Jew performs even a single mitzvah, no matter how small it is, to perfection, that merits him the world to come. And perfection does not only mean through action, obviously, but just as we are called to keep the Shabbat, remember, through thought, speech, and action. And to get to this level, there is only one way it can be acquired. Repetition. Let it become who you are, or rather allow yourself to become it. What's spinning? You, the world, or the Torah? What is moving here? You see? Now I understand why Solomon wisely said, Ma shehaya hu shehiye. What has been and what will be. I keep doing this, right? Once you pass the circle, once you pass the halfway mark, you're going to see that you're going to go right back to where you started. Why? 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 Until you get it. Because once you get it, you get it. This is why we do the same thing over and over again. Because God loves us so much, He's giving us every opportunity, even by accident, so to speak, right? It's like you got so many mitzvot that you're going to have to do one of those things right. That's the thought process to merit the world to come. But there still has to be free will, you see. Why is one of the greatest and most significant parashot in the Torah, when God 
completely and utterly connected with us. Why is it named after a pagan priest? What happened to the people? They were afraid. They went far off. He wasn't afraid. He didn't get jealous. He didn't get angry. He didn't try to claim this as his own. He didn't start a new religion. But he came and claimed the seat at the table, his seat, because it already had his name on it since the six days of creation. Ito. It's not about who you were or where you come from. It's about who you are and where you choose to go. Remember that. And that's it for the teaching. But before we go, just one thing to say. Um, I'm having a little uh, tooth thing tomorrow, Thursday. That's tomorrow. It's Wednesday right now. So I'm getting pulled. I hope, God willing, I will be okay to speak next week, okay? If I can, I will be here even for a short with the cotton ball in my mouth, but I'll be my, do my best to, to come back and to, to teach you, okay? So anyway, have a wonderful rest of the week, whatever's left of it. Have a Shabbat Shalom. Read the Torah, focus on the Torah, know where you stand, okay? And you'll be all right. Okay, so thank you so much for joining me. Have a Shabbat Shalom, and I'll see you once again on the other side. Bye.